So today's topic is getting into the habitat, assessing shallow water habitat in Maine lakes. Jeremy Deeds is an aquatic ecologist with the Maine DEP for the lakes assessment section. And he's been there since 2014. He's worked on water quality projects in the Northeast US over the past 20 years, allowing him to build relationships and share research ideas with other experts. He's a native Mainer and he grew up fishing and boating on the lakes of Maine and feels fortunate to work on studying and helping to protect them. At DEP, he studies various aspects of Maine lakes, including the measurement of changes in water quality over time and the role of shoreline development in shallow water habitat quality. He lives in Topson with his family who all enjoy getting out on the water as much as possible. Welcome, Jeremy. All right. Thanks, Tony. Um, first, I just wanted to kind of tie in what I'm going to talk about to the Clean Water Act. Um, so the Clean Water Act is 50 years old now. 50 years ago, our rivers were on fire. Some of our lakes were holding ponds for all different types of waste. Um, a lot of our waters were public health hazards. And, and just think about how far we've come during that time. We've had these significant advances in not only water quality regulations, but also how we've developed our understanding about these resources and, and, and how they work. So because of all this previous work, um, we're now able to look at different aspects of water quality, like um, thinking about different ecosystem processes, like, like habitat, like I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so our, our work is now, able to be expanded into these different areas to look at lakes and their natural functions instead of just cleaning up, you know, um, these those significant uh, messes that we had. So I'm going to get started now. Okay, so, um, and I think everyone can uh, relate sometimes when you're put on the spot, you're uh, to, like to come up with a title for a talk, for example, your first idea is not necessarily the best idea. So I'm going to exercise my right to change my title at the last minute. And we're going to go with underwater sticks and stones, the effect of lakeshore homes. Okay, so I'm going to start with the bottom line. What are we talking about today and what's 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 the purpose here? What we're talking about today, it's a survey and assessment method that we've been working on that'll help us determine if a the shallow water habitat or littoral habitat in a lake is meeting its natural condition or not. And your first question would be, so what? And that's a great question. The reason we're doing this or why we're talking about it today is this is kind of a new way to evaluate the effect that shoreland development has on individual lakes. Now, when I'm talking about shoreland development, I'm talking about the conversion of natural vegetation to things like homes and lawns and driveways and things like that. This is important because Maine's water quality statute for lakes includes, among other things, a provision that habitat should be as naturally occurs. But until this type of work, we haven't had a way to numerically measure or define what natural lake habitat means, especially with respect to the habitat in the littoral area. So let's talk about, when we talk about shoreland condition, we know that it has effect on the habitat in the littoral area. So when we have that loss of shoreland vegetation, it destabilizes the shorelines because of a lack of the root structure in the soil to hold it together. The erosion and sedimentation from the, that soil increases nutrient loading into the lake. But this also has an effect by um, when the shoreland habitat is simplified, you remove all the vegetation, it also simplifies the habitat in the littoral area. So that erosion, the soil rushing into the lake, smothers available habitat in, in the lake. It also reduces the recruitment of natural structures. So if you remove the trees and branches and things, you're not going to get that structure in the lake. So to help us visualize what we're talking about here, I want to have this little cartoon example. So here we have uh, the lake shore on top and the water on the bottom half of your screen with all the photos about the different components of littoral habitat we're talking about. So on shore, we've got a we've got a lakefront home. We've, we've got a nice riparian buffer. We have trees of different sizes. We have some nice shrubby ground cover. Um, the tree canopy protects the uh, 
energy of the rain falling to earth. It shades the water to keep it cool. The root structure of all that vegetation keeps the soil in place. And in the water, we have a network of habitat features. We have down logs and branches, and we have aquatic plants, and we have layers of boulder and cobble and things and spaces for little critters to, to live in. Um, you know, and, and for the plants, they are certainly their own biological community, but they also serve as habitat structure for other critters like fish and dragonflies and things. So here is this idea of kind of a fully functional littoral habitat. But what, have, what we're going to do is kind of deconstruct that riparian area and see what happens as a result. So first, imagine we have removed the trees. So we no longer have a supply of logs and branches for the lake. So that's gone. So we're left with, you know, maybe some rocks and some sandy areas and some macrophytes. But what happens now, the energy from the sun has a clear path to the water, which raises the temperature of the near shore water because of the increased solar radiation, which also may lead to increased macrophyte growth. So those plants may be growing more densely now because they're not limited by the shade from the canopy. If we remove the shrub layer, that was our last line of defense for stopping erosion along shore. So now that shoreline does not have a way to keep the soil intact. Wave action, ice action, um, extensive human use along the shoreline can um, erode the shoreline and that sediment will end up washing into the lake. And if that happens, that sedimentation in the littoral zone covers those spaces in between rocks and features in the littoral zone that are used for, for fish and for incubating eggs and all that uh, important area that used to be able to use, be able to be utilized by different animals in the lake. And of course, with that sediment, those sediment particles carry phosphorus into the lake, which can increase uh, plant density locally, but it also contributes to the phosphorus load for the entire lake. So um, it may have an effect on how much algae that lake can produce and sustain. So let's back up a little bit at this point. How do we know all this? And, and let's put it into context about what we know about lakes in general. So the National Lake Assessment, which is a survey of the nation's lakes, coordinated and carried out by the individual states, occurs every five years. The 2007 and 2012 National Lake Assessments found that lakeshore disturbance and reduced riparian cover were major stressors for lakes, especially in the Northeast US. And so we're seeing this situation and we're seeing that it's, it's occurring in our lakes and it's one of the major things that's impacting the quality of our lakes here in the Northeast US. So this is affecting our lakeshore habitat and it's affecting our shallow water habitat more so than other stressors uh, that are more prevalent in different areas of the country. So our colleagues in Vermont actually started looking into this before we did. They published a study in 2009 where they were looking at different components of the littoral area, um, the, the woody structure and the plants and the shading and the things like that we've been talking about so far, and found that there was a significant difference in all littoral habitat parameters they measured when they compared it to unbuffered developed sites like the house with the lawn to shore versus sites that had no development. So this really illustrated that shoreline development, if unmitigated by vegetated buffers, can have a pretty severe impact on the structure and condition of the habitat and lakes. And then we all joined up for a study um, in Maine comparing sites in Maine with the main shoreline zoning standard buffers um, with using measured with the Vermont habitat metrics that they use and found that if the property with development had an effective buffer that met shoreline zoning standards that the habitat was only minimally changed. So this was really cool because it showed that main buffers are effective at protecting littoral habitat when they are existing for the shoreline zoning standards which doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's effective at mitigating habitat condition. So we have a problem identified. The National Lake Assessment um, found this situation between shoreline condition and, and shallow water habitat, but that assesses all lakes across the nation. It doesn't really address what's going on in, in any individual lake. The Vermont and Maine study further supported these findings, but 
those studies were designed to assess sites from different categories, like developed or non-developed, among certain groups of lakes. But at the local level, at the DEP especially, what we want to be able to do is evaluate individual lakes for the condition of their habitat and determine which lakes might be um, have good quality habitat and which lakes might have poor quality habitat it might need be be in need of um, more restorative activity uh, actions so we have a problem identified and we have a solution in progress so the approach we're taking to address this is to use the national lake assessment methodology to evaluate the condition of littoral habitat at the local level for individual lakes because remember for maine water quality standards, we need to determine whether lake habitat is natural or not. What we're really going to need to be able to do is make a decision with new data based on previous findings. So we're going to have data from lakes and we need to determine what, how that data fits in to this decision framework and how we're going to determine if a lake is natural or not. So I feel, Usually in presentations like this, this is where someone introduces the data analysis black box and they say, we put the data in, the magic happened, and then this decision came out on the other side. Um, that makes for an easier presentation, but I kind of think that this group is uh, intelligent, interested and engaged in the world around them and can handle a little bit of data. So some of you out there, I know you live in this box with me. You, you know, the more numbers, the more graphs, the more plots, the better. Others of you may have different feelings about that sort of information. But what I wanna do is peek in the black box with everybody. Um, I assure you it'll be fine because I really think that if we can all be on the same understanding of how this thing was put together, um, we'll all have a better understanding of what we're trying to do and how we're going to be making the decisions that are based on this work. So if you'll bear with me for a couple minutes, we're going to walk through a, a kind of a silly example. So this is Bob. Bob starts a new job today. That's why he's all dressed up. And right now, Bob is standing in this kitchen, which is very white. And he is trying to decide if he's going to be late for work or not. And now Bob, He's thinking about a lot of different things. He's thinking about all the different things that can happen in his life and in his morning that will affect whether or not he's going to be late for work or not. So he's thinking about the time he woke up. How much time does he have in the morning? How much coffee does he need to drink before he can leave the house and function as an adult human? How long is his commute? Um, Obviously driving time factors in. If he hadn't bought that Ferrari, he wouldn't be so stressed out about getting to work on time, making good impression, but that's his life choice. Um, does, he stop to need, does he need to stop to get gas? And does he have kids? As many of you know, this one qualifier will greatly affect uh, your ability to get out of the house in the morning. Related to that, how many kids does he have? And how old are his kids? Now, hopefully Bob knows the answer to all of these things, but the important part here is that all of these questions can be converted to data, okay? All of these questions can be answered either numerically or categorically. You know, you can measure distance in miles and you have, either have kids or you don't. So, but that's information we can use. But the problem is, this is Bob's first day on the job. He doesn't know how all those data work together yet. So what he needs to do is take a survey from a sample population. So he's going to, poll different people, measure those variables, and see if he can predict um, whether he's going to be late for work or not. Obviously, Bob is more of a philosopher than a practitioner because he's just standing around thinking about this, but bear with me. We're just about through with this. Okay, so here's a sample population, and it's, here's some important considerations about this, whether it's a lake or your coworkers. Um, it's important to make fair comparisons when you're building models like this. So in this example, we want people to live in the similar areas and the same work locations. Ideally, these are all the people that live on Bob Street and work in the same building. And it's also important to know who's usually late for work and who isn't, the condition of, those, um, uh, of the samples in this population, the reference data. So, you know, if we know these two people are always late for work, that's useful information. It's like the saying goes, nobody is totally useless, they can always serve as a bad example. 
So that's what these two people are. They're always late for work. They're going to be one end of our spectrum. And then these two people are always early for work. So now we're developing the spectrum of people and informing the data we need to build this model. So now we are going to assemble all the data we need for all these people. What time do they get up? How much coffee do they drink? What kids do they have? And we're going to compile this all into data sets. Okay, so now we can start to look for relationships between the different variables and how that relates to whether they are on time for work or not. The next thing to do, oh, sorry. So these are all called metrics, different ways to measure things. The next thing to do is to get rid of the metrics that don't give us any, any valuable information. We want to use the fewest, lowest number of metrics possible. So we get rid of the ones that don't give us any information and we focus on the ones that do. So now we're going to combine these metrics into a multi-metric index. And this index is going to be converted to a score that tells us what the likelihood is that you'll be on time for work. Now, Bob's all set. He made this model. And what he did is called linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so this predicts outcomes for new data based on the sample population. Unfortunately, this took Bob all day to get through. He missed the first day totally and got fired, but he's going to be all set for the next job he starts if he can land a new job. So the point is here is that this is the same way that if you're familiar with uh, water quality assessments and screening using macroinvertebrates, it's the same idea. You're looking at different measurements, how they fit together, and how they add to the knowledge about um, making predictions for new data. So, but consider, you know, we're obviously not dealing with um, some weird philosopher in his white kitchen thinking about his car and if he has kids or not. But that same application goes with if we're talking about a lake and the different components of habitat. It's the same thing. What we're going to be doing is looking at different metrics based on measurements we take in the littoral zone and seeing if we can use that to predict whether the habitat is natural or not. And here's how we go about doing that. So we, we do what are called physical habitat surveys, or PHAB for short, or FAB if you're from Vermont. What we have are 10 sites along a lake. Now, all these sites are equally equidistant from one another, but they're randomly placed. So we're trying to get an overall characterization of the entire shoreland. Each station is divided into a riparian zone and a littoral zone. So we're, this is done from a boat and we motor or paddle around the lake and we take a series of observations at each station. In the littoral zone, we're um, looking at the uh, percent coverage of different types of woody structure. So either full down trees or logs, branches, uh, we're looking at the composition of the substrate. So the proportion of different kinds of um, boulders and sand and gravel and, and, and the like. We are looking at the coverage of different types of fish cover um, and aquatic plants, the, the variety of aquatic plants and how, how well covered the area is. is. In the riparian area, we're, in, we're observing the coverage of tall and short trees, the shrub layer, and um, natural ground cover, whether it's, you know, the dungy, uh, spongy duff layer, like you see in the bottom, in the forest floor or, um, or, or not. Uh, and we're also noting the presence of any human influences, as we, as we call them. Now, this is anything like buildings, lawns, roads, docks, agricultural fields, anything that indicates that humans are interacting with that piece of shore or, or that section of lake. And all these data get uh, collected at each of these 10 stations. So far, we have done this survey, these surveys on about 100 lakes in Maine. And I just want to throw this up there. Uh, the lakes are in alphabetical order. You can try and quickly find a lake if you're interested in a certain one. Um, if you don't see it there, it's because we haven't surveyed it yet or I spelled it wrong. Okay, so defining natural shoreland. So what we're trying to do is define what natural habitat is. And we know that habitat is connected to the shoreland. So the first thing we need to do is define what natural shoreland means and how to measure that. And then look at the, the habitat that is coinciding with those natural shorelands. So this seems easy, but 
when you think about the variety of lakes we have in Maine, it's actually kind of complicated. So these six pictures, just kind of taken at random from lakes around the state, all these lakes are pretty uh, well undeveloped. They exist in a fairly natural condition, but they're all very different. So the challenge here is to make to take measurements and be able to indicate how natural these sections of shore are for all these different lake types. And here's how we do that. So we're going to combine two different metrics into a riparian score. So we're going to look at the riparian complexity, which has to do with the vegetation on shore, small trees and shrubs, or small trees, we're looking at shrubs, both tall and, and low, and the percentage of the duff, the natural spongy leaf littery um, type stuff, um, or, or plants that make up the, the ground cover in the riparian area. And then we're going to factor in the site disturbance metric, which measures the amount of human influence. Now this metric in um, lays buildings and lawns a bit heavier because that's what we're really focused on here. Um, for example, you know, out west in the Midwest, the site disturbance index might be heavily weighted towards agriculture because there's more agricultural fields around lakes. But in here in our area, the shoreline development issues we're looking at are more residential. So buildings and lawns would be the big ones. That's what we're really trying to focus in on to see how those influences are affecting habitat. So we um, translate this, we combine those two metrics into our riparian score, which we call RIP score because it sounds cool. What this is, is a gradient from all the way from natural vegetation, completely natural, to one that a site that has heavy human influence. So for all those hundreds of lakes, 10 sites on each, we have this gradient where the, the most heavily developed site is over in the red and the most undeveloped natural site is over in the green. And now what we're going to do is take those, lock those two ends off using the bottom 20th percentile and the top 80th, top 20th percentile and have our developed and our natural sites. And we're going to use those sites to, as the most like extreme examples of shoreland development and natural condition to see if there's a signal in the littoral habitat, the in-lake habitat, that those two different sites of types of sites. So to go a little further with that analogy, the developed lake sites are the ones that are late for work, the natural sites are the ones that are early. And that's how we're going to see if we're seeing a signal in the uh, habitat or not. Okay, so just kind of to summarize how, how we're doing this, the linear discriminant analysis models, LDA, just like Bob did in this kitchen, um, but instead of looking at you know, how far our drive is or how many kids we have, we're looking at the different measurements of littoral habitat structure. So sticks and rocks and things like that. So we're gonna determine the most effective combination of those habitat metrics to classify new data. So we're gonna use sites at both ends of the spectrum, heavily developed, completely natural, see if there's a, a signal in the habitat data that let us know, that reflect what's going on on shore. So using the different combinations of our habitat measurements, we created about 30 different metrics. Um, after the process where we, we get rid of ones that aren't helping us, helping inform the model more, we ended up with about eight metrics for um, the, the final models. Um, the success of these models is based on a number of things, but what I'm going to focus on here was the percentage of sites that were correctly predicted. So when we did our, our aggregating and we're looking at our associations, we, we reserved 30% of the sites for what we call a validation data set. We know what category they came from. So once we develop our models, we take the models to the validation data and test it out. And since we know what category they came from, we see how correctly our models are predicting uh, the site categories. And so that we're making fair comparisons, we use two groups of lakes, deep lakes and shallow lakes. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more um, in just a minute. But very brief on the results, I promise. Um, I'm going to focus in on, on the model success rates for both deep and shallow lakes. We had a success, successful prediction rate of greater than 90%. Now, if you're the type of person that lives in that black box like I do, that's very exciting um, because we're, the models are nine, over 90% 90 of the time getting it right. Um, if you don't understand how exciting that is, that's okay. You have to take my word for it and just be happy that us black box folks are happy too. 
So the most important metrics, it was different for the deep lakes versus the shallow lakes. So the most important metrics in the deep lakes were uh, the percentage of sand, the variability of the substrate types. Um, so, you know, fine substrate, grain, fine grain substrate versus coarse grain, um, how variable that was, right, to say, the amount of large woody habitat, so the, the larger logs and down trees, and then a metric which were about habitat cover, which takes a look at different sizes of woody habitat and also coverage of aquatic plants. The most important metrics in the shallow lakes were one we're calling habitat complexity, uh, which incorporated both down and live trees, uh, if living trees were in the littoral zone, uh, boulders and ledges, which would be sort of like drop-offs within the littoral zone. The amount of fish cover, um, which are metrics that include the woody structure, overhanging vegetation from the shoreland, and boulders again, and also the, the amount of fine sediments uh, in the littoral zone. So what lakes, what makes the habitat in deep lakes and shallow lakes different? So in deep lakes, um, well, first of all, this is maximum depth, and maximum depth is not necessarily directly related to habitat, but it's related to a lot of other things that make lakes unique and different if they're shallow or deep. So one of the bigger things about lake depth is that deeper lakes are often larger. Larger lakes have more wave action because they have a larger surface area to catch wind and be disturbed by wind. So if a larger lake has more wave action, the waves are bigger, those waves have more energy to redistribute substrate particles and also woody material, the logs and branches and things. Um, the steeper slopes of deeper lakes um, may cause those structures like the logs to slide into deeper water just because the slope is steeper or um, just enough to be outside of our survey plot, which only comes a certain distance away from shore. Deeper lakes are also have more water in them um, and they're generally less biologically productive. Um, there are exceptions, but that's, that's kind of a common trend. Um, so we have less plant growth um, in, in, in deeper lakes as well. So the amount of plants we'd expect at a deep lake versus a shallow lake would be different. So that's going to be reflected in our habitat metrics. Shallow lakes, conversely, are smaller, generally smaller, and smaller lakes have less wave action. So there's less energy being uh, tossed around the lake in terms of waves. So you have more protected shores and also coves um, in shallow lakes, which be, would be a larger portion of the lake than in, in a larger, deeper lake. So you have areas where habitat can aggregate, like this photo with the, the logs. They all just kind of hang out there because there's not enough wave energy to move them or distribute them around the lake. Um, they may have more fine sediment because of that lack of wave action. And they are, you know, if deeper lakes are less productive, shallow lakes are often more productive. So they can often pr pr uh, support more plant growth than deeper lakes. So these are some kind of the key attributes between deep and shallow lakes that led us to separating them out for these habitat assessment models and, and why we think that that is. Okay, so we have our assessments, we have our model scores. Now for every site, we can assign a value based on our multi-metric index, based on the, which is based on those most important habitat parameters. So what we need to do now is kind of bring those values together so we can get an assessment for the entire lake. And we're going to do that with confidence intervals. Now confidence intervals, you've probably seen these before, even if they weren't called confidence intervals. They're widely used um, and it basically has to do with the variability and spread of data, okay? So these three bars, these lines, the blue, the yellow, and the red, they are um, bounded by the vertical lines on either end. So within those bounds, we are 95% confident that any new data will fall within those bounds, okay? So here, these confidence intervals and their bounds are, are plotted on the LDA score, okay, from our multi-metric index. The higher the score, towards the right of your screen, the more natural. So the higher the score, the closer the habitat is to the natural condition. The lower the score into the negative, the less natural it is. So those are the sites that are more developed. 
and more impacted by human activities. When confidence interval the bounds don't cross zero, then we say this confidence interval is significantly different from zero. And we're going to use that in our decision making on whether or not the habitat in the lake is natural or not. So the one on top, the blue one, the lower bound is above zero. That is significantly higher than zero. So we're going to call that lake natural. The red lake is the upper bound is less than zero. So that's confidence interval is significantly less than zero. We're going to call that lake developed because it's far enough from zero, it's far enough from the natural condition that it is exhibiting habitat that is very far from natural. And then in the middle, if the confidence interval includes zero, it's in this intermediate zone where it's not really one or the other, but it's in the middle. It's still valuable information, but we're not going to make a strong determination about it because it's, it's in that middle ground. So now we can take all those hundred or so lakes that we've done and we can plot them here and compare them to one another. And now the blue lakes are, or I'm sorry, the natural lakes are blue, the intermediate lakes are in the yellow and the lakes that are heavily developed are in the red. Now the keen eyed observer here will notice that I've replaced the lake names with Star Wars characters. And there's a good reason for that. Um, mostly that we are not at a place where we're ready to make these sort of assessment designations and put them out there yet because it's still in process and we want to make sure all the models are refined and we have everything exactly where we want before we start making these decisions. But I wanted to show this because it's kind of how um, we'll begin to process this information, compare lakes to one another. And I know as a competitive person, all of you out there that have a special lake, you want to make sure that it's in the blue, it's higher than your neighbor's lake, and you're better than this lake or that lake. And I get that, and we'll get there someday, but that's not today. So now you have to deal with Star Wars characters. But I assure you the data are all there. So applicability, how are we going to put this in practice? What, are these, what do these designations mean? So for natural lakes, those lakes serve as the model for what natural littoral habitat is. That's our best example of the natural condition. That is how we are going to define, use the, the definition in terms of interpretation of water quality standards. Those lakes in that condition should be prioritized for, their, for conservation because of their condition. Um, if some of them are already conserved, that, that's great, but they could be highlighted for either greater protections or, or conservation activities. The intermediate category, the middle category, these are likely lakes that would benefit greatly from localized protection efforts. You know, the, the old thing that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. These are lakes that are kind of on the threshold of, of being, you know, so switching over into the red, it likely wouldn't take a lot of shoreland restoration to bring them back to the blue. The developed lakes, these are the ones that will become a priority for agency and resource managers, managers for our lakeshore improvement efforts. So these lakes may also be designated as impaired, similar to how we list lakes as impaired for algae blooms or declining trophic state. But now we have another kind of tool in our toolbox to assess lake condition and see which lakes need the most help. Um, and I, it's, it's important to note that, you know, by addressing this habitat condition, it's not just about habitat, it's also about nutrient loading because a lot of this is about stopping erosion, stopping sediment and the nutrients it carries from getting into the lake. So what's next? As I mentioned, we're still sort of continuing to refine these models. Just one of the, kind of the last lingering issue I'm dealing with is that the model is underscoring habitat condition in some minimally disturbed lakes. So some lakes without much shoreline development, the scores are a little low. And what I'm thinking is that um, it could be water level fluctuations. Water level fluctuations certainly impact habitat condition, but what we're seeing is that even some lakes with a natural outlet and natural water level fluctuations simply based on precipitation um, may be exhibiting um, uh, habitat in a worse condition than we would expect based on shoreland condition. So that's something that we need to be able to measure and tease out and, and have, be more definitive about how we're explaining. Um, so still working on it. Um, we are expanding these surveys to research habitats in different types of lakes. Um, you, 
some of you may have heard me talk before about like classification and different types around the state. Um, we're investigating differences in those and um, that may lead to refining the models based on habitat condition for different types of lakes beyond just shallow and deep. But that's a study that we, we are uh, beginning. There's certainly a role for a volunteer monitoring program here, um, you know, a, akin to the water quality monitoring uh, that's done through Lake Stewards of Maine. These surveys are not specialized. You don't need taxonomic skills or special, um, you know, special skills, it's a certain amount of training. Um, and, and anyone can do these surveys. If we get volunteers doing this sort of thing, we'll greatly expand our, our abilities to have a look at habitat condition around the state. And Lake Smart is an obvious natural partner for lakeshore restoration. So um, it's great to work in a state um, like Maine for a lot of reasons, but with a, a or, and a program like Lake Smart already up and running, um, we can help, we can work together to help prioritize work on certain lakes that need it the most. Um, and the framework for helping people restore their shorelands is already, already in place. So I see um, the uh, restoration portion of this is, is already being sort of in the works, which is a really cool. So I want to thank uh, a lot of my, uh, a number of colleagues at DEP that have helped with uh, either field surveys or method development, program support, analysis support. Um, it's been a real team effort. Phil Kaufman is kind of the godfather of Habitat, um, which I did bet you didn't know existed. And he works for the US EPA and has been helped in, uh, a big help in thinking through these ideas and developing this work. And my advisors, uh, Dr. Zaria and, and Steve Norton from, uh, University of Maine in, in shaping the analysis and the presentation. So that is all I have planned for today. I am happy to take any questions. And awesome, thank you. This show. And we do have um, a few questions. So uh, let's see. The issue of boat wake appears to be the major, a major source of erosion on shorelines. And um, this is a particular question from somebody on Lake Arrowhead. Um, they see extreme erosion even where all of the riparian cover has not been removed. The lake is very narrow and almost all boating is done within the state safety zone of 200 feet. The result is the shores are pounded by large waves. How can we get the laws enforced? The main warden service, play, the main warden service plays lip service only. I don't know necessarily that you can answer that question, Jeremy, but it does bring up a good question related to your analysis and how you treat what seems to be a natural shoreline that certainly has example, you know, exhibit signs of human influence because of boat wakes. Absolutely. That's a great question. And I wish I had an answer. Um, but I have, you know, I have <laughs> been sitting in a boat doing a littoral habitat survey when a wake boat goes by you know, 50 feet from shore and we just get, you know, just pounded all over the place. It's, it's an issue for sure. Um, I, I don't really have a way to speak to the enforcement, um, but I do know that, that folks, especially at Seven Lakes are looking into kind of measuring the effects of these boats and doing some really cool research on this to help, to hopefully help inform um, some legislation or something with a little more teeth that can help, you know, mitigate these, the, the effects of those boats. Uh, let's see, another person asked, curious what the distinction in depth and surface area might be for deep versus shallow and large versus small lakes? Uh, well, okay, so the, the distinction here is deep versus shallow is a maximum depth of 10 meters, uh, which is about 30 feet. And that comes from the statewide average Secchi depth, depth transparency for main lakes is about five meters. So twice secchi depth is the photic zone, which is the, the distance that light can penetrate. It's, it's a coarse estimate, um, but it's something that helps us uh, kind of look at lakes a little bit differently. Lakes that are on the edge, um, I would probably run with both models um, to see, to, to, to paint the complete picture. I mean, because a, a nine meter lake and an 11 meter lake can be very different or very similar. Like it's, it's, it's not an absolute threshold, but it does help us kind of organize our data and make a little bit more sense out of it. Um, 
and the large versus small, you know, that's, that's something that's been done in different categorizations for different reasons with different thresholds, but it's not, I haven't found it as useful here for this sort of thing, um, for what I've done. This question is kind of related to that. Um, Bunny asks, how do you care, categorize a large, meaning many miles wide lake that is not deep, but shallow? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, like with anything else, there's always exceptions. <laughs> um, but that would be that would be a lake, the especially large but shallow lakes would be one that I would definitely look at both ways to see um, how it was coming out and and um, what what sort of conditions we're looking at and how to best describe it and see what makes the most sense. I mean, we would never make a final decision on a lake without thoroughly looking at all the information we have available. And then that's the case now, if we're looking at changes in trophic condition or, or whatever uh, you we're using to assess the lake and make a uh, designation decision about it, we, we use all the information that we can. Uh, so I guess, I guess my best answer within this hypothetical situation is to say that I'd look at, you know, both models uh, and, and part of the, what I hope to be able to do once we gather more data is, is to make another cut in the data set of, of size as well. Um, because, you know, working on this type of model, we really need a, a high number of, of sites and, and samples. So if I stratify the data set again, between deep and shallow to small and large, and then be working with a pretty small number of lakes to develop models like this, I will say that um, I have applied this to more of a regional assessment because there's interest in all the New England states about adopting some sort of habitat assessment uh, for them for themselves. And we have national lake assessment data and state level data across the six states. And it was the same parameters that came out as most important. Like um, lake depth was more important than lake size, just in terms of the success of the model and the different metrics we use to evaluate how the data are coming out. So I feel pretty good about using lake depth as that categorization. It'd be nice to be a little bit more specific, but until we get a lot more data, um, that won't be exactly possible. Okay. Um, Tristan Tabor asks, within your Star Wars characters graph, do you see a single or a couple of factors that's really expanding your confidence intervals? The number of samplings for some of these is greater than others, I would assume. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, there, there are lakes with much wider confidence intervals than others. And I think it's just the variability of the habitats. I mean, think of a, a large deep lake that has very even shoreline, that's a perfect circle, right? Um, it's gonna have all the shorelines are gonna be exposed. Think about a more a wiggly shoreline lake with lots of coves and some exposed shores and some protected coves. It's going to have a lot of differences in the habitat as it's measured around the lake. So, um, I guess the, the the goal is to get enough of a characterization of the habitat in the lake. So even if some lakes have exposed shorelines that are developed, um, is there enough habitat in the lake for critters to get to if they need to? You know, not every you know, not every point along the lakeshore needs to be immaculate habitat, but is there enough left for lake animals to use it and do what they need to do in that lake, even if they can't get to all sections of the lake? Uh, here's another question. Is there a need or an opportunity to restore these habitats within the lake, such as actually adding logs or branches to the water along the shoreline, as well as improving buffers on the shore? I... I don't think so. I, I, I think that the best thing that we can do is just restore the shorelines as best we can, let nature take its course. Um, I, I do know that I think they had a campaign, I think it was Wisconsin or Minnesota, um, where they were promoting the, um, the value of wood in the littoral zone. So people started cutting trees on shore to fell in the water, which was not what they were going for, obviously. Um, so I'm, <laughs> I don't think we're, I don't think we're there yet, but I think that, you know, just working towards the more natural shorelands, um, would be, 
would be the way to go. Um, so, yeah. Certainly, like similar to to the practices that are promoted through Lake Smart. Exactly. Yes. Keith Williams would like to know why max depth rather than average depth? Because, well, a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that we, you need lake volume to calculate average depth, which we don't have for all lakes. So maximum depth ends up being a great predictor for a lots of different things because it correlates to so many different things, including average depth. And I like to go simpler when I can so I think that max depth works because it's easy to measure. We have it on more lakes and, um, and just the way it associates with, with so many other variables like lake size and average depth and things that can be harder to get and, and enumerate on different lakes. Great. Um, in the chat, there's a lot of thanks for your presentation and for your good work and um, Somebody said at Coastal Rivers, they would love to help pilot a volunteer monitoring effort. So it looks like you have some folks out there that would be willing to help out with some volunteer work. That would be great. Um, yeah, like I said, we're uh, working on refining this. And once it's at its you know, final, final spot, I'd love to be able to explore getting a, a volunteer system going. Um, so I'm not sure how long, how far off that is, but hopefully, hopefully at some point. Cool. And I think that's all the questions that we have. Let me just check one more time. Uh, one more. The wake boats you mentioned can have an effect on the bottom of shallow lakes with the downward direction of pro propeller wash. Can you speak to how this potential scouring of lake bottoms can have an impact and possibly include that in your model? Um, it would be hard to include in the model, but it certainly does have an effect on how sediment is redistributed. Um, you know, there's so many variables, like which way the boat's going, how close to shore, all that kind of thing. They could certainly be kicking out fine sediment, you know, from deeper out and putting it more toward shore or vice versa. Um, the redistrib redistribution of sediment is certainly occurring. It's hard to make a blanket statement about how that's being, you know, um, how that's affecting the littoral area and different areas of different lakes. Um, but it is an interesting thing to think about. And... You know, I, I, I just kind of wonder and speculate where those boats are having a greater effect. Are they the ones that are more developed? You know, I think that it, it may be that those two things are, can go hand in hand. So, which would just complicate how things are, are being measured as well. So, so that might be captured in, in some other parameters that you've already set there. That It, it could be correlated. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> I was wondering, you know, in the surveys that you've already done, have you seen some good examples on developed lakes of, of good habitat that's intact? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's, you know, there's, there's something we kind of talk about, like, I don't have a good word for it, but it's like a cultural lake effect. Um, like if somebody, if, if one person seems to have like a giant pink flamingo floating out for a swim platform, there's probably four or five other pink flamingos sitting out in the lake as well. Um, and that goes for lawns and it goes for buffers and it goes for the lakes kind of have a different, a unique uh, kind of vibe, I guess. Um, so, you know, your neighbors are watching. So keep your buffers good and hopefully they'll follow suit and avoid the pink flamingos if you can. Just ugly. <laughs> we have a question here from somebody named Dan Buckley. Oh, I don't think we can take that one. I, I considered not, but he asked, <laughs> how does your model account for underlying differences in local geology and sediments? That's a really good question. And I am addressing it in the next phase of the study which is we are doing a uh, probabilistically selected lake study in the different um, lake classes that we've developed in Maine. So we have six different lake classes based on um, lake depth and hydrogeomorphic characteristics across the state. And we're doing a random selection of lake surveys in each. So the goal of that is to do not only um, 
sort of a status assessment, which will let us know the habitat condition, uh, you know, across Maine, but also we will use that to see if we're seeing differences among those lake types that are based on the, the geology um, and morphology of the lakes in each. So this one, this phase of the study was more about, you know, looking for lakes that were at both ends of those spectrum, like heavily developed lakes and, and better and higher um, more natural condition lakes to see if there's a signal and to use the two ends of the spectrum to really um, see what the extremes are and develop models that reflected that that difference and that the, the difference across the spectrum. Now we can use these models to do a more randomized selection which gives us more of a regular condition assessment of, of how lakes are doing. Great. Um, I'll do one more question. Um, Bunny's wondering if you divided the lakes into three zones from north to south. Um, more or less. Yeah, there are three zones. Um, and it's not necessarily north to south, but that's the, it does kind of figure into how the lakes are, lake conditions being expressed in the three zones. There's a northern, a coastal, and an inland region. And um, I don't know if the talks from last year are up, but I gave another main lakes talk about that lake classification where I talked about the different zones and, mm -hmm. and why they're different. So if, if it is still available, um, you can check that out. Um, there's also a brief article on lake stewards, uh, or no, I'm sorry, lakes of Maine uh, about that uh, work, so. Great. Well, thank you so much for your great presentation and your wonderful work. I think, you know, we're all really glad to hear about all this great stuff being done within our state. And in addition to, you know, the wonderful work that you're doing, I personally am going to take away a little nugget of information that I, you know, I love this. Everyone is useful. You can always serve as a bad example. So <laughs> let's go out there and be good examples for Absolutely. our Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone be early for work. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Thank you so much. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Thanks, everyone.